Welcome back to Mr. Holmes World History Class. Today we are looking at Standard 22, SSWH 22, Analyze Globalization in the Contemporary World. Our essential questions that we're going to be looking at today are how can we achieve globalization? Our second one that we'll be looking at is how has warfare changed in the global contemporary world? So we're going to start out with element A, describe the cultural and intellectual integration of countries into the world economy through the development of television, satellites, and computers. So the development of television, satellite, and computer technology since the 1980s has made it possible to disseminate information around the world easily and immediately. Satellites are important. They're used for communications, weather, navigation, and military purposes. Television is important because it spreads information and art to large numbers of people simultaneously. Uh, we do see the rise of English here uh, as a principal world language due to American and British programs that are broadcast internationally. Yet we still see diversity remain. For instance, like telenovelas, uh, they also find audiences outside of Latin America. Uh, another good example is CNN's broadcast of the Persian Gulf War that was watched around the world and inspired international versions of the news network. Uh, computers have changed problem solving and processing capabilities. So now we provided artists all types of new tools for film, photography, music, and writing. Computer, computer miniaturization has made computers and many other electronic technologies available to huge numbers of people across the world. The internet has allowed people to exchange information almost instantly, and this is often dubbed the information revolution that we're currently living in. It has also been embraced as a vehicle for business, dubbed e-commerce. Many companies, both global and local, use the internet for marketing, sales, and research. Only real image we can look at here that's worth value is taking a look at the various satellites that are in Earth's orbit at a given time. So we have hundreds of satellites revolving around the Earth currently. Next element, element B, analyze global economic and political connections including multinational corporations, the United Nations, OPEC, and the World Trade Organization. So we have the United Nations we're very familiar with. These are World Trade Organization members, so vast majority of the world are WTO members. Um, and then we have the crest for UNICEF, which we'll be discussing. So multinational corporations, they're going to really be our agents of technological change and global transfers of wealth. Companies in industrialized nations have the economic power to invest directly in mines and plantations in poorer countries. So this has been made even easier by international trade agreements and open markets. Trade agreements made it possible for companies to relocate to escape restrictions and regulations imposed by any one nation, especially those in the industrialized world. Developing nations desperate for foreign investment are going to offer fewer regulations. Uh, we'll definitely see a resulting in lower wages and fewer environmental protections in these specific countries. So for instance here, this is why we see the growth of, of a global market for these particular uh, industries. So for instance, this is why we see McDonald's in Saudi Arabia even today. Here's a political cartoon poking fun at NAFTA, which was the North, North American Free Trade Agreement, which essentially uh, allowed for the process of American jobs, manufacturing jobs to move to Mexico. Um, so here you can see it poking fun at uh, Christmas here, Santa specifically. United Nations. The United Nations uh, are going to really start here in 1945 uh, at the really end of World War II. Uh, countries will join together here. 
Uh, we've already discussed the United Nations in great detail, but here we're going to be discussing some of their, their lower branches here. Um, so it was designed to, as we know, maintain peace and security for member nations, promote international cooperation culturally, politically, and economically. We have the General Assembly. Uh, each member nation will be given one vote. And then we have the Security Council with 10 rotating member states, five permanent state members. Permanent members have veto power. The UN administers several organizations that promote peaceful cooperation globally. So, for instance, the WHO or the World Health Organization fights disease. And we see the Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, it is going to guard against food scarce, uh, scarcity. We also have UNICEF, works to protect children around the world. UNESCO coordinates international cooperation as it relates to education, science, and culture. And these are all their uh, symbols here, crests. OPEC, 1951, Iran's going to nationalize its oil industry. Its effort was to receive greater economic benefit from its oil reserves. Immediately, you have a boycott of Iranian oil, uh, and this will demonstrate individual countries had little power on the world oil market. 1960, oil countries in the Middle East and Latin America formed OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, to promote their collective interest in the global oil market. OPEC has proven to have considerable political as well as economic power, most clearly demonstrated in 1973. Uh, in response to the support for Israel in the Yom Kippur War, OPEC cut off shipments of oil to the U.S. Uh, and the Netherlands. This is going to create high prices for those uh, nations in 1973. We'll also have an oil shortage in the U.S. Uh, price hikes will follow in 1974, and they will hurt many other countries, including Japan as well as its manufacturing industries that relied heavily on oil. So here are all the major producers of oil in the world. And here's a political cartoon uh, poking fun at the U.S.'s reliance on Saudi oil. The World Trade Organization, or the WTO. 1995, you had over 100 nations join together to create the World Trade Organization, and this was to facilitate free and reliable trade around the world. It was designed to reduce trade barriers and enforce trade agreements between nations. Free trade, however, was not universally beneficial. It did put pressure on manufacturers and workers in developed countries who lost job security, it will also put pressure for domestic, social, and political reforms in developing countries as conditions for financial support and investment. Division over the WTO's mission is evident at a 2003 meeting. Uh, nations here were unable to come together when developing countries pushed richer countries to lower their agricultural subsidies, leaving poorer countries at a disadvantage in the world market. So this is seen best in the um, existence of NAFTA, where you had uh, Mexicans whose diets, um, for the most part, rely heavily on corn uh, here uh, due to subsidies in the United States. You had Mexicans who weren't even able to grow corn any longer because they were of such the um, growing... Um, that, that occurred in the United States. Now, here is a symbol for the WTO, and here is a political cartoon poking fun at the WTO. So it says, when elephants mate, many ants get crushed, which is an African proverb here. And it says, rich nations' governments, uh, multinational corporations, and poor nations are seen as ants here. Now, finally, we're looking at element C. Explain how governments cooperate through treaties and organizations to minimize the negative effects of human actions on the environment. Here you have Chernobyl. This is in the 1980s when you had uh, the Soviet um, USSR 
uh, nuclear plant uh, explode and create all sorts of uh, environmental issues. Um, Kyoto Protocol is another very important meeting that we'll discuss. And here's a political cartoon discussing the Kyoto Protocol. Now, in terms of negative effects of human actions on the environment, industrialization around the world plundered natural resources and polluted the environment. Nations, as a result, have struggled to come together on solutions. So strip mines ruin land. We have pesticides destroying soil, water, and insects. We have oil spills killing marine life. Air pollution has led to acid rain. Emission of greenhouse gases has contributed to global climate change. And just to give you further examples here, we had a, in 1984, you had a leak at a pesticide plant in India kill over uh, 3,500 people. We also had the meltdown of Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Russia exposed thousands to lethal levels of radiation. As developing nations really work to gain economic footing through industrialization, Solutions to overpopulation and environmental damage present, present unique challenges. So our nations, our developing nations that oppose environmental treaties uh, that would regulate pollution inhibits their ultimate industrial growth. They point to the deforestation and pollution caused by industrial countries in decades and centuries past. So they see an unfair advantage there, disadvantage. The Kyoto Protocol that will be adopted by over 100 nations at a meeting in 1997 was part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It, what it did was it bound participating nations to meet certain emission reduction targets. So it put a great burden on developed countries uh, because they were the ones that primarily were responsible for the high levels of greenhouse gases but required action by all countries. We did have U.S. President at the time, President Clinton, sign it, but the Senate will never ratify the agreement, and thus the U.S. remains outside the Kyoto Protocol. So again, our Kyoto Protocol, this was the uh, symbol for it. And finally, here is a political cartoon making fun of it. It says the intensive Who Cares unit uh, saved the Kyoto Protocol. So here you can see that global change is becoming a real problem, but you can see uh, at the time that this was made, President George W. Bush is supplying CO2 to uh, the world or Mother Earth here.